You know the bed is for you, not the gift. A cold voice woke Gabriel up, followed by a scream. Ah! He fell from the hammock, and as he lay there, he opened his eyes to find Aina standing next to him, her head looking down at him. The high ye huddled in the corner of the bed, clearly as surprised by Aina's presence as he was. Why did you sneak into my room? Is privacy something you don't understand? Gabriel stood up. I wanted to see what you did with my gift, and I have to say, I'm disappointed. But let's drop the small talk. You slept through the resupplying. Your armor arrived. Aina stood in the doorway, waiting for him to follow. Gabriel was still tired. He had no choice but to obey, so he glanced back at the high E one last time before leaving. I have a question. Why couldn't I understand the insects? My translator worked fine with everyone else. I knew you would ask that someday. I deleted their language, thinking it would limit your mercy. But my concerns were unfounded. You showed no mercy at all. I can still hear their screams echoing through my ship when I think about it. Aina showed no signs of emotion, hinting that the screams didn't haunt her. On the contrary, Gabriel suspected that she was delighted by them. That ended the conversation until they reached a small hall filled with all sorts of weapons and equipment. Aina began speaking. This is the cargo hold. I hope you remember the way down here. Then she fell silent. Gabriel was trying to come up with a response to her, one that simply stated a fact, when Chip walked in behind them. Are you excited, Gabriel? I would kill for a power armor as good as this. I bet it costs a fortune. Aina cut her off before she could continue. You're late. Start calibrating the suit to his needs. You will pay if it doesn't fit on his next mission. Aina walked away, leaving them alone in storage. Chip watched her leave before speaking again. I know exactly what you're thinking right now. And yes, it has a forearm cannon. Chip led him to a box. Actually, I'm thinking about leaving. Aina said you'd pay if it didn't fit me, and I'm sure she didn't mean money. Gabriel wasn't just going to forget that Chip had put weaponized parasites inside him. I would probably suffer greatly, but she wouldn't hesitate to send you into combat without the armor. So please, just shut up and let me transform you into a god of war. Chip opened the box, revealing the armor. It was white and thicker than the plate armor he was used to, and it had no gaps for projectiles to pass through. Want to start with the helmet or boots? Let's do the helmet, Chip said, taking it off the rest of the armor and handing it to him. Gabriel put it on, activating it. A bunch of numbers lit up in front of his eyes. Chip grabbed his head and pointed at the top right indicator. This is your hazard indicator. It analyzes the suit and your surroundings and informs you when the suit is damaged or when you're surrounded by danger. Yellow means pay attention, and if you ever see anything in red, scream for help. Her finger moved to the top left corner. Communications is self-explanatory, but look at the bottom left. This number is your kill count. I installed it myself. Gabriel was getting used to looking around with the helmet when Chip picked up his left leg and put it in the armor boots, repeating the same with his right foot. Comfortable? She didn't look up. It's a bit too tight, Gabriel admitted. He didn't want to be picky, but pain was not an option. Chip adjusted the size. Better? Yeah. The leg shouldn't be an issue. TB measured you very precisely. Chip was right. The armor fit him perfectly. Moving his legs around was a bit difficult, but doable. What the fuck? Chip looked up at him with a dead expression. The power unit is in the chest compartment. What just moved your leg? I, I did, Gabriel stammered, afraid he had broken the armor. Is that bad? Don't scare me again. Not everybody is comfortable with you being an innate killing machine. Chip said, pointing at the rest of the armor. I won't carry the chest plate to you. Come here. Gabriel complied, feeling like he was wearing ski boots and a motorcycle helmet. He helped Chip lift the upper body armor onto him, and it snapped into place. He was holding his shoulder plates when the armor turned on with a rhythmic hum. The top right corner was blinking red, which scared him. 
Hey, Chip, is it supposed to blink red? Gabriel asked. It thinks you lost both arms in combat, dummy. Finish putting on the armor and it'll stop. Chip chuckled, completely unaware of his ignorance and the fact that he had no way of knowing anything. They put on his arms until Chip held his left forearm before him. This is your arm cannon. It has one explosive bullet in it, so there's no reloading. Don't waste it. A precise shot with this beauty could penetrate the hull of a ship. She followed up with, How do you feel? I can't think of anything scarier to meet on the battlefield than the person I'm looking at. There was awe in her voice. I feel good, thanks, Gabriel replied, pleased with the upgrade but wanting to return to his room. He couldn't stop himself from thinking about the high E he had left behind. Chip seemed to read his mind. The suit can stand on its own. Just go, she said, visibly frustrated that Gabriel wasn't as excited about the suit as she was. He was heading to his room when Tibby crossed his path. Happily surprised, he asked, Why did you choose the high in my room? Aina chose the hostage and made it clear that she didn't want you to know. I can't say more, Tibby responded. Gabriel begged, Come on, give me something to tell her. Can't talk about it. Just ask Aina if you want to know more. Tibby turned and entered a room, closing the door behind her. Gabriel considered talking to Aina for more information, but he knew she wouldn't tell him if she didn't want to. Besides, he would rather talk to anyone else but Aina. So, he walked to his room. When he entered, he saw the high E freeze upon seeing him. Not wanting to frighten her, he mimicked her behavior. Their staring contest ended when she spoke. Did I do something wrong? Are you here to kill me? It suddenly struck him that he was still wearing his new armor suit. She couldn't recognize him and mistook him for another crew member. He slowly removed the helmet and showed his hands, saying, It's me. Please don't panic. They gave me a suit. He then focused on taking off the rest of the suit, clumsily dropping the helmet in the process. The loud bang it made as it hit the floor made the high E flinch. But Gabriel didn't notice as he struggled with the suit. When he couldn't separate the two upper body plates, he turned to her and said, Two things. First, what should I call you? I'm sure the high E isn't what you want to be called. Second, can you give me a hand? Z Zuski, she responded. My name is Zuski. As she walked up to him and touched his suit with two fingers, the suit fell off in pieces. Where do you come from? This suit's locking mechanism is standardized all around the galaxy, she questioned. Gabriel felt torn. Trust couldn't exist without honesty, but the existence of Earth was his last secret. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, she hesitated. Especially because I am your gift. Gabriel replied firmly. You are not a gift. Objects are gifts. You are a person. Why can't anyone understand that people aren't things? Gabriel was infuriated by the casual way everybody spoke about slavery. I, I'm sorry. I'll try to do better, Zuski said, kneeling on the floor. Gabriel's initial anger melted away as he saw her. How much had she suffered to be completely broken? He helped her up, trying to express his feelings. I come from a place that abolished slavery a long time ago. Seeing such a barbaric practice disgusts me. I'm not angry at you. There was nothing you could have done. The captain, Aina, placed a bomb inside me, leaving me with no choice but to obey her commands. You are an attempt to gain my loyalty, Gabriel explained. But before he could finish, Zuski interrupted. She told me that I'd face a worse fate than the other prisoners if I didn't try everything in my power to be a good gift. I'm scared of what she means by that. Gabriel saw the fear in her eyes. I will tell her that you are the best gift possible, but please, stop referring to yourself as an object in the future. Although his fate was in Aina's hands, he would still do his best to help Zuski survive. Call me Zu. That's what my friends used to call me before. You know, I was taken. All right, Zu, how can I help you? Gabriel searched for any way to be kind, but his alien manners were outdated. I need food. They didn't bring me any after tying me up. These were words he wanted to hear 
a task he was capable of fulfilling. Okay, anything else? He asked as he stood in the doorway. Please don't forget to tell Aina that I'm a good gift. Zuski pleaded. I won't, I promise. Gabriel despised how Aina scared people. He entered the dining hall, where he found Pin waiting for him. Pin began to speak. You're here to bring the girl food. Gabriel grew worried and asked. How did you know? Pin responded. No one else was given that task. How is she? Gabriel pretended. She's everything I could ever want. Why do you ask? I thought she was my gift. He didn't mean any of those words, but he had to maintain his cover. I've been Aina's right hand for a solid decade now. This isn't the first time she has used prisoners to her advantage. I am here to warn you that she'll manipulate you into doing terrible things with the girl, so you'll think of yourself as deserving of her treatment. Don't, Pin warned. He shut down any further conversation and left Gabriel alone with his thoughts. Gabriel had no intention of hurting Zhu, but it was good to have Aina's objective confirmed. He made his way to the food dispenser, where he noticed a row of nonsensical symbols. He chose the one that looked most like a bird, unable to find a pattern that would hint at anything. He pressed it, and a steaming compartment revealed a plate of berries he had never seen before. Intrigued by the prospect of new food, he took a bite. The berries tasted sweet and soft, so he pressed the button again. The same compartment opened with another plate filled with the same berries. He took both plates and made his way back to his room. He was expecting some sort of unpleasant surprise. But when he opened the door, all he saw was Zhu wrapped in a blanket, asleep. He put the plates on his desk before waking Zhu up. Hey, wake up. I brought you food. He shook her shoulder to wake her. Zhu's eyes opened a little bit before closing again. She must have been very tired. He knew from experience that being abducted is stressful, so he laid down next to her and waited for her to wake up. However, he underestimated his exhaustion, and a few minutes later, he fell asleep. He woke up as if it were a Sunday afternoon, turning around to check on Zhu, but saw that she had vanished. His heart skipped a beat as he jumped up, ready to unleash hell on whoever took her, when a small outcry from behind him got his attention. It was Zhu, lying in the hammock, awakened by the commotion he caused. He let himself fall back on the bed, relieved that nothing had happened. Are you okay? Zhu's voice was sleepy. She must have woken up while he was asleep and climbed onto the hammock. I thought they took you. Gabriel sat up and saw that both plates were empty. Please don't be mad. She saw him notice the desk. You wanted food and you got food. I see nothing wrong. Gabriel walked on eggshells with his response, not wanting to trigger anything within Zhu. But I ate your food. She responded. She did. But he couldn't afford to admit that. Both plates were for you. Why, didn't you just order one big portion? Is this some sick way of manipulating me? Zhu's voice started shaking again. I told you that I woke up on this ship a few days ago. I've been lucky to even bring you the correct food. You really don't know anything, do you? He knew she wasn't trying to insult him. Barely anything. Do you? I worked as an assistant, so I can navigate most machines. But that's about it. Her voice was calming down again. I hope I didn't scare you when you woke up and saw me. He recognized that going to sleep next to her was definitely an invasion of her privacy. It was a kind surprise. I'm only in the hammock because I didn't want to wake you. Gabriel just laid there, unable to figure out an appropriate response, when he saw Zhu's hand reaching down for him. He took her hand. It felt warm, soft, and was covered with feathers. This was the first act of kindness he had felt since he woke up. Still stunned by what was happening, he lay in his bed on an alien ship, holding hands with an owl humanoid. This continued for a while with him enjoying the moment, and her probably too, but he couldn't see her face from the bed. 
until Zoo started to talk. You want to play a game? What? Gabriel was expecting a lot, but being asked to play a game wasn't one of them. I'm not hungry and sleepy unless you have something better to do. He figured it out. Zoo didn't want to be left alone with her thoughts. We could plan our escape. Gabriel hadn't even had the chance to think about escape before. We could. What do you have so far? I just need to get the bomb out of me. Find someone who can fly a ship. Find a ship and that's it. He heard how stupid he sounded as he spoke the words. There was no way to accomplish any of those goals. Gabriel and Zuski decided that the planned escape had to be delayed until further options presented themselves. Plus, neither of them wanted to talk to the crew or even leave the room for anything but the essentials, causing them to simply be stuck together in a room. Zuski didn't take long to teach him the games of her home planet, showing herself as a big board game geek. All of them were either weird variants of chess or some abstract puzzles against each other. Gabriel wasn't much of a board game fan, but he was split in what he enjoyed more, seeing her eyes light up when she beat him or winning himself. So they played day and night, switching between games and house rules they invented to balance each other. Until Chip opened their door in the middle of a game, he was definitely going to lose. She inspected the room before talking. I'm here to bring you to TB. Can you follow me? This isn't a question, is it? He turned his attention to Zoo before standing up. Let's call it a draw. She rolled her eyes but didn't want to talk in front of Chip. It's not. She waited for the door to close behind them before continuing. The suit Aina gave you is not only highly valuable, but also a custom-made marvel of destruction. Leaving it in a small pile on the floor is super disrespectful. Put it together. Disrespectful to you or Aina? He didn't care about the armor, but knowing who he was angering would be nice to know. To the suit, it's called respecting your weapon. Ah, it was Chip. Chip was pissed by the way he treated his armor, but why didn't she just say so? Chip continued. You're not supposed to know, but the mission you'll replace Pin in, you know, the mission you traded the girl for, got a whole lot more complicated. If I were you, I'd get some real use out of her to get even in the deal. Gabriel didn't know if he was supposed to be more scared about the first half or more disgusted about the second half, but he was still keeping cover for Zoo. Trust me, she's entertaining in more ways than just games. Chip chuckled at his response. Why did the mission become more complicated? Aina called it a change of associates. We're here. She opened the door, waiting for him to enter. He did, and Chip closed the door behind him. It was the room he woke up in. In the middle was the padded table, and all around the room were white cabinets and what he thought to be medical instruments. Tibby was already waiting for him. How are you feeling, Gabriel? Well, you bought me. Forced me to- f I can't change any of that. Tibby interrupted him. But I can take care of your body. How about you take a seat and I'll do my best to make the pain go away. She was clearly just trying to perform her duty, so he followed her request. Let's play a game. You get to ask a question, and then it's my turn to ask one. All the time with Zoo got him in a more playful mood, and he was desperately trying to answer some questions anyways. Sounds fair, but you know that there are some questions I simply can't answer. I know. Start the game. Gabriel was already laying on the table. Do you feel pain in places you're not supposed to? Tibby undressed him to his underwear and started examining his bruises. The bruises in my elbow hurt, but I got shot at. Hence, it's supposed to hurt. Tibby turned away to get something. My turn. Why are you on this ship? You don't look like a soldier. Tibi brought back a paste, which she was now applying on him. Long story short, the Confederacy is smuggling scientific assets out of Union territory, and I'm supposed to help the commanding officer to target and return anything of relevance. But you know Aina, she doesn't have much patience for retrieval missions. All she knows is efficacy at all costs, leaving me to be basically a glorified medic. Tibi was visibly irritated by her fate. My turn. Did you experience headaches, dizziness, fatigue, anxiety, or insomnia post-rampage? 
Gabriel had to actually think before answering. Hmm. Insomnia, headaches, and dizziness definitely not. But having a bomb inside me doesn't combat anxiety much. Well, you're clearly not fatigued. That's good. She finished applying the paste. The cream I applied should help you, but who knows? I usually don't treat giant beasts. You can leave now. Gabriel took the opportunity presented. It's my turn one last time. Why was Zuski chosen? Tibi looked at him confused for a moment before figuring it out. You mean the girl? I warned you that some questions are off limits. By the way, you don't have to play games if you want to know more about war, Aina, or genetics. I used to be a professor before the war in Aina. Gabriel opened the door, expecting to find empty hallways, but was surprised to see Chip leaning against a wall. What are you still doing here? I thought boredom would drive you to put parasites in a bomb or something. Chip started walking in the direction of his room, so Gabriel followed. I'm here to get you battle ready. The mission starts once we dock. You would have known that if you took the time to eat with us. That took Gabriel by surprise. Am I not supposed to be better trained first? You yourself said that I'm out of my depth using the suit. He was scared. Dude, you are literally a living weapon. Just do what Aina says and you'll be fine. And don't worry about the girl. Aina made it clear that none of us are allowed to mess with her until you two are back. Chip reassured him. They reached Gabriel's room, and Chip started suiting him up without any shenanigans or insults, while Zoo and Gabriel held eye contact. Gabriel didn't have to say anything. She knew exactly what he was about to do. The suit booted up without any issues, and they made their way to a new part of the ship that Gabriel hadn't seen before. They entered a large room with an airlock inside. Pin and Aina were already engrossed in a conversation, but they stopped when Gabriel joined them. Aina started. Did Chip brief you? She said I would be fine if I followed your lead, so, yeah. Gabriel replied uncertainly. Sounds like she did not. We are meeting with a clan of purists who are prejudiced against modified beings, so keep the helmet on. You don't need to argue about whether you are truly modified or not. They won't believe it. Aina explained. Gabriel was already preoccupied with the thought of encountering space racists when Aina continued. They aren't my favorite mercenaries, but they will do just fine for our assault on the gate. Gabriel shifted his attention back to the conversation. Why do you need me or Pin for that? His gaze fell upon the injured Skeeks. Mercenary business has become unreliable since the war began. You are my bodyguard. I want you to listen very carefully. Do not start a fight. Your suit will protect you from small arms fire, but it won't save you from the bomb once I die. Aina instructed. Understood, Gabriel acknowledged, trying to strike a menacing pose to convey his readiness to do whatever was necessary. Let's go then. Aina walked into the airlock and Gabriel followed, with the lock closing behind them. Another, much larger ship appeared in the windows and docked with theirs. Aina sat down on a box and leaned against a wall. This takes some time outside of combat, so you might want to get comfortable, she advised. Gabriel didn't particularly look forward to spending quality time with Aina, but he was afraid that she would consider their deal unfinished if he didn't follow her commands. So he sat down opposite her. Aina took this as an invitation to talk. How is she? She asked. The Hai? She's worth me being here. Why did you choose her to give to me? He wasn't going to enjoy this conversation, but he'd definitely get answers. A whole bunch of criteria. Harmlessness, biological compatibility, and I thought you'd like a Hai after waking up to TB. Aina replied calmly, indicating that she had been through many docking maneuvers before. Biological compatibility. What do you mean by that? Gabriel asked, already fearing what Aina was about to confirm. You created a bloodbath after seeing combat, so I concluded that instincts are a big part of your decision making. Hence, she needs to survive you raping her, if that's what you do by instinct. Aina said, 
as if she was just greeting a friend, not giving a care about the content of her statement. And she obviously did, she followed up with. Gabriel couldn't help himself any more. How the hell do you sleep at night knowing what you've done? He asked, though he knew he shouldn't be mean to Aina. You do not get the bigger picture. The wave of desertion I have created will end this war years earlier, saving tens of millions of lives. Even if I killed thousands in the most horrific ways, what I have done would be a forgotten footnote in the books written about me. Gabriel, I am saving so many lives with what I am doing that people won't fully comprehend the extent of my actions. The war is almost over. Taking Rutha will be the last step before I retire to some backwater world with unimaginable riches. Aina explained. Gabriel didn't know what to think anymore, but fortunately he didn't have to, as the doors opened. 